Okay, uh, hope you can see everything fine. Um, let me just start by saying I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I'll try to remember to stop every once in a while and, and ask for questions, but uh, feel free to put it in the chat or interrupt if I'm not clear. As I say, I'm very happy to stop and, and answer your questions. Um, so Kathy Nagel already uh, has, has given you a fly neck uh, lecture and, and today and Monday, we're gonna, we're gonna give you a lot of about flies. Um, and the reason for that really is that, that nowadays flies, you can delve into neural circuits in ways I think that really have never been before been possible. And so this gives me a chance to, you, to not only just explain to you about, about flies and what they do in their circuitry, but also to tell you about the methods uh, used to figure out what's going on, both theoretical and experimental, and also uh, tell you how things work in, in really great detail. Um, and so uh, let's dive into that. Um, today's lecture is going to be about uh, how flies know uh, which way they are heading. Um, by that, you, you, I mean which way is their head pointed, so this blue arrow. Uh, but what makes this a, a tricky problem is that <clears throat> we're talking about not just how is the head oriented, let's say, relative to the body, but how is the <clears throat> head oriented in the world relative to some landmarks in the world, such as the sun or any, any kind of fixed landmark. And so this is the system by which the fly really relates its own body and its own actions to the world around it. Um, it, it, it involves an angle that I'm gonna call the heading angle. That's that H angle, <clears throat> the angle between some landmark or some fixed point in the, in the environment and the head orientation of the fly. Um, I'll get back to it at the end, but you know, this is really more than navigation. As I said, this is really how the fly um, fixes itself in the world and understands its relationship to the world. So that's today's lecture. I'll just give you a hint about uh, Monday's lecture. Um, so that's gonna consider another problem, which is how does a fly know which way it's traveling? Now, you might say that that's the blue arrow as well, but flies, for example, often fly around in a wind. And so the direction that they're traveling in the world may not match uh, the direction that they're heading in the world. And so there has to be a computation to compensate for the drift introduced, for example, by the wind. And again, we're going to talk about that direction in reference to the world, what we call the allocentric traveling direction. That's what T-allo means. Um, okay, so that's, that's, that's tomorrow, uh, Monday's lecture. Uh, but um, I'll come back to, to the uh, first topic. So the reason I can tell you any of this and really everything I know about this system was taught to me by my collaborators. Uh, for today's lecture, it's the people on the left, uh, people from Janelia, in particular, Vivek Jayaraman's lab. Sung Soo Kim was kind of the lead on this, but Anne and Sandro did extra theory work. Um, and then for Monday's lecture, I'll come back, but Gabby and, and Chung were, were, were instrumental, but I'll, I'll cite a lot of Vivek's and Gabby's work both today. Okay, here's a fly brain. Um, that's the whole thing. Uh, you see on the edges are the, the optic lobes. So this is the, the eyes and the processing of, of images coming into the central brain, which of course is in the middle. Um, and uh, the um, Kathy Nagel, I was probably talking about mushroom bodies. So that's, that's this up here. But what we're going to talk about is this uh, central stuff in the brain called the central complex, uh, not just this donut shaped object, but actually a few structures, which will introduce as the time goes on, uh, the, the donut that you saw there is called the ellipsoid body. Um, Behind it is this uh, large fan-shaped body. That'll be important more for Monday's lecture. Uh, but today we'll also uh, talk about this protocerebral bridge in blue, the kind of arched shaped thing. And the, the noduli down at the bottom will come up a little bit uh, again in Monday's lecture. So those are the structures. 
You can't see them all in this picture because they're, they're at different depths in the brain, and this is just one slice, but I'll show them to you as we go along and introduce you to both their structure and their function. Okay, so um, this whole story gets off the ground uh, because of a discovery in this ellipsoid body, the, the pink uh, donut-shaped object in the center of the brain. Um, that object can be divided up into segments. You kind of see this here in a um, colored segments produced uh, genetically in this system. And you see on the right in the sketch that it is divided up into wedges, wedges and tiles. And very naturally, you can define an angular variable uh, are, that circles around this structure um, and, um, and defines these different segments of it. Now, that property is going to be true of every single structure I talk about uh, in the talk, so keep it in mind. They're all laid out very nicely topologically, and then they, they care, their different regions can be labeled by an angle variable, like here, 0 to 360, around the circle. Now, the great discovery about this system made by Selig and Jairaman a, a, a number of years ago is that if you image the, the activity, this is calcium imaging of the neurons that um, innervate this uh, ellipsoid body, um, you see a bright spot of calcium, presumably linked to a bright spot of activity or a hot spot of activity. We call this a bump. Um, and it occurs at some angle around this circular structure. And the, the wonderful discovery was that that angle is directly related to the heading angle of the fly. And remember the heading angle of the fly in the world. Um, and so uh, this really is the discovery that launched the whole uh, topic that I'm gonna talk about in my two lectures, uh, the idea of navigation in the fly, uh, once this, uh, compass signal, it's called a compass signal, was discovered, uh, it, it led to many other things. So um, uh, the, um, this system is sometimes called a compass system. Uh, it doesn't mean a magnetic compass. It's a, it's a visual compass primarily, also works on kind of any sensation that allows the, 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 the fly to figure out which way it's heading, but it doesn't use magnetic signals. Um, so I guess there's a there's a there's a uh, yeah, question there's, in the chat. Is that true? Yeah, there's a question uh, by Bidisha Kundu. Why not toroidal? Is there any structural motivation? Why not? Sorry, what? A toroidal structure. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So so that's a really good question it, it, that that I might as well get from the beginning. So. Um, obviously, flies orient, you know, in, in the horizontal plane, but they also fly, so they go up and down. And everything I'm going to talk about is in the horizontal plane. Now, partly that's because those, that's the way the experiments have been done um, for the for the this uh, ellipsoid body. There hasn't been a lot of work about elevating the fly, but in the experiments that I'll talk about Monday that this angle was considered and it just didn't seem to be represented. So um, we, we're, I'm gonna be talking about two dimensional navigation as, in a sense, and therefore the tor toroidal property here uh, is not gonna be used. But um, you may know about work in bats where the three dimensions are represented on a toroid. It's not really known but I think probably unlikely that that's what's happening here. And as I say, the elevation of the fly, we don't really know much about how that is represented. So I'm all in the horizontal plane. Uh, thanks for the question. Is, is there another yeah, one? Yeah, there's another one, which is what happens with it in the blind flies? Uh, very good. I'm gonna get to that very soon. Uh, okay. So, so, uh, so uh, this is the compass system. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about how that studied. This is actually a, a rig in Gabby Maiman's lab. Um, if you look carefully, you should be able to see a fly that is mounted under the microscope so you can image its brain um, and it's walking on a ball. And really all of this work is, is possible because flies uh, accept uh, virtual reality. All of my, all the talk, I'm, all the work I'm going to talk about is really based on that fact. Um, and so this fly is going to be put in a virtual reality setup. 
Um, and that works like on the next uh, slide. So here, the fly is on the ball, the ball is being monitored. And that means when the fly walks, um, <clears throat> the experimentalist can pick up whether the fly is trying to turn, go straight forward, go backwards, whatever. And in a closed loose setup, this bar, which is gonna be the, the landmark that this compass is gonna to orient to, um, that bar uh, moves around as if it was stationary in the world, but the fly was turning. Of course, in actual reality, the fly is stuck because it's, it's glued to a microscope stage, but, um, but it, the virtual reality is moving around the fly as if the fly were turning really in the world. And here you see it happening. So you can see the track of the fly has been uh, superimposed on the ball there. When the, when the fly moves, the world moves in the opposite direction as if we were actually in reality or the fly was in reality um, and, and, uh, and, and can, can you know, convince the compass system to track that object. Okay, so here's a, a, a video from the Jairaman lab where you can actually see this happening. So what you have to watch at the bottom of the screen here is the legs of the fly and you should be able to see that on the top, this bump that you can see within the ellipsoid body will be stationary until the fly starts twisting with its legs. And when the fly turns on the ball, you'll see the, um, the bump will flip. So there the fly just did a little twist and now it's gonna twist back uh, in a second, I guess, there you go. And so, et cetera, you can record this as the fly walks around, does its turns, and, um, and everything plays out. Okay, so just to get this, this uh, firmly in your head uh, or in the fly's head, if you want, uh, here's a fly that imagine it's, it's orienting itself relative to what I've shown as the sun, but it can be any object. Um, in its head is this ellipsoid body. There's a bright spot of activity. That bright spot of activity is not necessarily aligned with the object, of course, Often we don't really know which object the fly is orienting to, but even when there's only one object in the environment, it's not that that <clears throat> necessarily points to the landmark, it's just locked to it. And what that means <clears throat> here is if the fly turns, um, that hot spot of activity, the red dot, turns in the fly's brain, <clears throat> excuse me, but it actually re it remains stationary in the world. So uh, that's just gonna hold a fixed thing, just like a compass needle would if it was in your hand and you turned, it would still you know, keep pointing towards the north. Uh, okay, so um, I wanna uh, show you a, a uh, track of a fly under normal conditions. So, so what I, I guess what I'm showing you in this part of the talk is just that this has behavioral relevance for the fly. So far, I've showed you that there is this compass signal. It maintains a fixed direction. Um, and, um, it, but here, here you're going to actually see it uh, governing the behavior of the fly. So if, if you just do the experiments I was <clears throat> telling you about, um, you get <clears throat> a trace like this. So this is the angle that the fly is moving across time going down. And you know, you see the fly is just wiggling around going this way and that way. But if in these experiments, you make the fly a little bit uncomfortable, for example, heat it up a little bit to a temperature, it doesn't, it's not in pain, but it doesn't like, then what it'll do very sensibly is just try to get away from the spot where it's located. And it does that by walking in straight lines for long periods of time. This is 10 minutes. So for minutes on end, it will walk in a straight line. It won't necessarily walk towards the landmark. It just walks in a straight line relative to the landmark. Here's a, an example where for an hour, the fly <clears throat> just kept going in a straight line, traversed many meters. And of course, this is great because now there's a behavior that tells you how the fly thinks it's oriented and you know, what, what, it, what it thinks is going on. So in these experiments, they first did kind of the, the obvious thing, which is the fly here is maintaining a constant direction that the traveling, the turning velocity is zero. So it's in one of these, what's called menotaxis states. Um, and then what the experimentalists do is they jump the bar to another location. 
that convinces the fly that for some reason it's been jostled and turned. And that's this. And what you can see is that the fly then makes a corrective turn to get itself back to the same direction. And that you're seeing that here. So the fly is orienting itself relative to the bar <clears throat> and will maintain a constant angle. <clears throat> but the cool part of these experiments is here where now somebody asked about this and I'm gonna get this into this much more, but now you turn off the bar. Now in the dark, the, the um, bump tends to drift a little bit but it still maintains its orientation and it's updated by the motion of the fly. The fly is aware that it's turning. And so uh, this system still works. But in this case, you can do a neat trick, which is to optogenetically bump the bump. So instead of, of, of externally rotating the world, you internally rotate the fly's world. And when you do that, likewise, the fly makes a corrective motion back to its uh, original angle. So it wants to maintain this bump at a fixed angle. If you bump it over to there uh, with optogenetics, the fly will turn in order to bring it back to the same orientation. And the turning of the fly is able to move this bump around in a similar way to the way a visual image does. And in my talk, I'm gonna go through the mechanisms by which this works both the visual image mechanism and the self uh, motion uh, mechanism. Uh, do, do we have another question? I can take that if you want, or I can wait. No, no, no. No more question. questions, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, here's an here's a, 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 a example that I really like. So again, this animal, this fly is in the dark. Um, you should think of time starting at the top here and going for, you know, many sort of almost an hour here. And this is the angle that the fly is walking on the ball. So again, this, this fly is not happy where it is, and it's taking what it thinks is a straight line path away from the, uh, the, where it is. Now, it is not going in a straight line, as you can see, because this is its angle, um, and in fact, it's going around in circles. It's, it's very steadily going around. It's, it, it's, it's, it traversed about two circles over the course of this hour. Now, why is, this, why is this fly doing this? Well, you can look into the head of the fly and look at the bump angle. And you can see that the bump angle is maintained absolutely steady. So this fly thinks it's walking in a straight line. But what's happening is that because the the, the compass doesn't work perfectly without a visual object. It drifts a little bit. The compass is actually drifting and the animal is turning to keep bringing the compass back to the same place. So this turning here is a compensation for the drift of the bump, which then when you add the two together is being held steady. So if you ever walk around in the woods or something lost and you're going around in a circle, uh, this is what's happening inside your brain. You think you're going in a straight line, but you're not. Okay, um, to finish the, the, um, this system, I need to introduce you to this other region of the brain that I showed you at the beginning, uh, this kind of uh, thing that looks like a bicycle handles. Uh, it's called the protocerebral bridge. It also is divided into segments. Um, and as a result, it can also be labeled with an angle. And really what you should think of the two sides of the protocerebral bridge as two more circles. They're just circles that have been broken open and laid flatter. But if you, if you link the 360 end to the zero end on both sides, you'd get a circle just like below, just for some reason anatomically, uh, this doesn't lie in a circle, but structurally it is a circle um, and the activity goes around it on each, the left and the right side. You'll see that in a second as if it was a circle. So there's a bump of activity here that goes around this circle and there's a bump of activity here that goes like this. And when it gets to this end, it hops back to this end and goes around this sort of pseudo circle. And the neurons I've been talking about, what are sometimes called the compass neurons, um, are, are a project to both areas. So they, you've seen their processes in the ellipsoid body, but they also have processes up there in the protocerebral bridge. And as a result, 
there are actually three compasses going on in the brain. Let me just show you a diagram so you get uh, the structure of these, and, and we're going to see lots of neurons like this. Um, uh, Larry, I have just called... one question. Yes, um, please. The, you know, the segments in the protocerebral bridge and ellipsoid body, uh, do, are, they, are they anatomical segments or are they just arbitrary? No, no, they're anatomical. Uh, you can kind of see them here a little bit. You know, um, in this diagram, they've been uh, highlighted by labeling neurons, but basically uh, the same, well, let me show you in the diagram. I think it, what I was gonna say will be clear. They're defined because the same neuron innervates this region and this region. So they real and, and those neurons do not cross, their process do not cross the boundaries. So they really are areas defined by the neuron processes. This is not an ar arbitrary at all. Um, okay, so these neurons that I've been talking about, the compass neurons, you are seeing their activity down here are called EPGs. E stands for ellipsoid body. P stands for protocerebral bridge. And G stands for another area where they project that I've not shown here and that we won't talk about called the gall. So, um, so these, these cells, and you'll see that throughout my two talks, are labeled by where they make their processes. So, so in addition to seeing activity down here, you'll see activity in these different ones. Now, there are different cells for the different compartments that we have here. These are called glomeruli up here, and they're called uh, wedges or tiles down here. Um, but you know, we can just think of them as angular compartments. There are actually more than one EPG compartment, but I didn't draw it that way. And there's another set for here, another set for here, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a complete set of these for each of these anatomical segments. Um, and these neurons are, are sometimes called columnar neurons as a result. And almost all the neurons I'm gonna talk about have this structure. So keep it in your mind of a family of neurons that tile regions of space. And I'm gonna be talking about their activity collectively like I have so far. In other words, I wasn't talking about any one neuron's activity down here in the, in the, EP, in, in the ellipsoid body. I was talking about the bump formed by their collective activity. And that's pretty much always what I'm gonna be talking about. But they have this structure like this, very highly structured, um, and very nicely aligned. In fact, that's how we can define the angles. So let me show you this uh, uh, um, uh, movie made by Chung Lu in, in Gabby's lab uh, that really shows you all three bumps. So this down below is the ellipsoid body. There you can see the bump, the compass bump. And then this is the protocerebral bridge. And you can see the two compass bumps that are its, its copies. And if I turn it on, you'll see they all three move together and they jump around the corner. So there's really three compasses. And the reason for that is that the compass is sort of made within the ellipsoid body, but it's gonna be transferred to a lot of neurons. I like to think of the proprocerebral bridge as kind of a junction point where synapses form to send this, uh, this heading signal to many other neurons. And, and we'll get into that more uh, in my Monday lecture about what you can then do, what sort of computations can be done with the with the heading signal. But it, there, it, it, there's a it, question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the previous figure, what are the gray regions at the two ends? Yeah, very good. Yeah, I was afraid somebody would ask that. So there, there is a special set, as you might imagine, it's a little tricky that this has to go around and then jump, join. And so there are a special set, which I have not shown here at the end that sort of complete the loop. So it turns out that the angle at the end is split between two and, and that, that's part of the gluing of the circle. So it's a little glitch caused by the fact that this circle has been opened up. Very good question. Um, and and there's, a, there's a special class of neuron to take care of that problem. Uh, okay, so uh, let me get into a little math. Uh, there yeah, are just really... another question. Sorry, oh, yeah. sorry. To, to... Yeah, yeah. Please interrupt uh, me. That's totally I, fine. So there's a question by Arnapal. Uh, do uh, how do these structures develop? Do they have the same origin? Yeah, 
I don't, I, but the best answer is that I really don't know. Obviously there's some very tricky axon guidance going on here uh, to get everything lined up. I mean, you you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till Monday's lecture. This whole system is so beautifully arrayed by I assume kind of this, this sort of standard axon guidance mechanisms, but I do not know in detail uh, how this, this uh, structure develops. It's not present in the larva of the fly, so it develops as the mature fly uh, you know, develops. And, and uh, that's about all I can say. It's, a, it's obviously an interesting research question for developmental people. Okay, so here's a model of this whole thing. We really have a good model of this system. Um, that model already existed because uh, it, it had been built um, to, um, to, to study other systems in mammalian systems, you know, by the Sompolinsky group and others. Um, and then it's been adapted to the fly system by the lower set of references. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take you through the different terms here uh, and, and uh, walk you through this whole system uh, in, in really quite a bit of detail. Um, two more questions. Can, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Can these regions generate nausea for flies when locations are abruptly changed in an experiment? You mean like when they conflict? Yeah, I think sensory conflict is what they mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I, I you know, it's whether they get nauseous, but yes, you can set these systems into conflict. And I will get to that at the end of my talk. Let's assume for now they're not in conflict, but it's a really interesting question. And it looks like this system is really set up to, to resolve some of those conflicts. As, as we all know, you don't often know which cue is the most reliable. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I promise I'll come back to that at the end. And the um, second question is, what is the purpose of such redundancy in having multiple compasses that get the same input? Yeah, so, so really, I, you should think of this as one compass. It's all the same cells. And, and my explanation for it is down here in the ellipsoid body is where the, the computation is made. This is where all the inputs come in, by the way. So the inputs that drive the compass come in down here. And this is really a way of getting that compass signal to other cells. So there's tons of synapse up here by which this compass system is broadcast. So think of this as the real compass and this as a broadcasting system for the compass. Okay, that makes sense? Uh, okay, so let's get back to this. So this term in this equation uh, describes connections between different compass neurons. So I here stands for which uh, wedge are you in around the circle? Um, and as, as you saw, the, the neurons are labeled by that. Um, and this describes uh, a constant inhibition and then the connection between uh, a, a neuron in wedge I and a neuron in wedge J. And it's approximated by a cosine. It's probably not exactly a cosine. It, it isn't exactly a cosine, but there's a term that's exactly a cosine. So um, it's a good approximation. And you can see the, the, the rate of the neurons all the way over here, but this is the rate of neuron J going into this synaptic connection matrix and being fed out uh, to the neuron I. So this, is, this term in red is the one that makes the bump. There's local excitation to pull the bump in, and there's long range inhibition to hold the bump from spreading out. Um, and we'll see uh, that as, as we move along. So these terms are the terms that allow the bump to turn in the dark. Um, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, so these are, uh, if the fly moves its legs, that signal, I'm moving my legs and turning to the left, go up to the protocerebral bridge, activate these terms and, um, and make the bump turn in response to it, the fly's own motion. And this last term, is uh, the light coming in. That's to represent a visual object. The, the visual landmark is supposed to be located at, at V, the angle V here. Um, and, and we'll talk about this term. That's, that's where the, the vision is coming in. Um, okay, so um, there are, uh, you know, I'm gonna go through this, but, but there are really 
detailed circuits associated with each of these terms that, I, that I'll now dive into. Let me just tell you about the different models. So I'm gonna break this model down. Obviously that expression on the previous slide was pretty complicated. So again, I'll talk about this first. This is a model that generates a bump, but that bump is not coupled to the rest of the world or the fly. It's just gonna sit there and do nothing, but that's the self-sustaining bump. And, and we talked about this, this is the matrix, the connection matrix between these EPG neurons that holds the bump together and self-sustains it. So this bump is self-sustaining. It'll just sit there in the dark or in, when the fly is not moving and maintain its place. Although, you know, given enough time, it'll drift a little bit. It's not a perfect, um, you know, line attractor, we would call it, but, but it's pretty good. Okay, then we can add these terms. I will add these terms that, as I say, allow the motion of the fly, its own self sense of motion, even in the dark, to move the bump. And then what I could do is to then add this visual term, but th this model is kind of complicated. So I'm going to break it up and I'm, I'm going to just add the visual term to the original model rather than, than put everything together. But of course, in reality, everything is all put together. Okay, so let's start with this guy. And I just wanna show you the evidence uh, for how this gets made. Now, um, what we need here, oh yeah, I guess first I'm gonna run the model, so sorry. So, so this model, um, if you take the function f, f is a nonlinear function, just to be a rectified linear function, for example, it has to have some kind of nonlinearity. So rectified linear is as good as anything else. Um, and you just build this model, what does it do? Well, here's a model like that, that, that I built that um, follows those equations. It has, again, uh, activity within the ellipsoid body and, and it has activity in the bridge. That's the, the, up here is supposed to be the bridge. And, you know, it's a pretty boring simulation because if I turn it on, all that happens at this point is the bump forms in some place. Now, the model I've described that bump could be anywhere around the circle. It happened to just form here because of the initial conditions that I set, um, but it could, it could be any place and it will just sit there forever uh, because this model is perfect. In reality, it'll probably drift a little bit because the, the real circuit is now perfectly adjusted the way this circuit is. Okay, so that's the simple um, thing. So what, what are, is the basis of the connections that support the bump? In other words, this matrix, these are connections between a neuron located in wedge J and a neuron connected, uh, located in wedge I. Now, there are many ways. A major way is excitatory synapses between these EPG cells themselves. In other words, the compass neuron sends synapses to each other um, and they are, you know, in some pattern. <clears throat> to tell you the truth, that pattern probably isn't a pure cosine, but there is another one, and this is going to be useful for my talk on Monday, which is why I'm raising it. There's an, <clears throat> another source of, these, of this matrix, and it's an indirect source. In other words, these EPG neurons, um, rather, they, they do directly talk to each other, but they also talk to each other through an intermediate neuron, which is interesting, and I wanted to, to, to uh, introduce it. So these are the two major ways that EPGs interact. They have a direct interaction, but <clears throat> they also um, go through the delta-7 here. So, you know, I've shown it directly going back um, and, and through the delta-7. Um, and, and the delta-7 one is pretty interesting because it actually is, the delta-7 is an inhibitory neuron. So you would say, well, you know, this looks like it would flip the sign of the cosine. It would be minus a cosine uh, because it's inhibitory, but it also has a 180 degree shift. So the way, the way this pathway makes the cosine is actually to make minus the cosine shifted by 180 degrees. And I, I introduce you that because that is the tricks of the trade in this system. These neurons play off excitation and inhibition and shifts of various angles in the anatomy in order to do uh, basically trigonometry. That you'll see that a lot on Monday. Um, this is just a simple example. There's a very simple trigonometry where you just flip the sign, but um, this delta seven plays this little sign, double sign flip trick. Um, now, 
a big tool in our being able to work out uh, this circuitry is uh, there, there are really three tools. I'm, I introduced you to the virtual reality that's critical for this mm -hmm. thing. Um, but and, and I didn't really talk about, but another of the tools is the ability to uh, put calcium sensors or various um, molecules that can manipulate activity into specific cell types. So that's the, the genetics that was developed at, at Genelia um, to specifically target, probably Kathy Nagel talked about this, neurons. And then the third gigantic tool for our use um, is the connectome. So in particular, we've used a lot the what's called the hemibrain connectome. Every connection within this red part of, my di of the diagram here um, has been worked out. It's, uh, there are 20,000 neurons in this red volume and 20 million synapses. Um, and we know, uh, we know about every single one of them. Uh, and so this is an incredible database uh, that you, you know, I, I would urge you to look it up at this new print site. You can go look up all of the neurons that I'm talking about um, and verify that they're connected in the ways that I'm saying they're connected uh, by looking at this site. So this is a, a, an amazing tool. It was an immense project. This is the first paper that came out just reporting it, uh, give, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of this project. But um, probably more relevant to my both of my talks is a recent analysis that came out looking spe specifically at the central complex. So this is a remarkable paper, again, from the Jairaman group, um, looking at the anatomy. And, and in this circuit, the anatomy tells you an enormous amount of how this circuit works. So um, <clears throat> that this is, uh, I'll come back to this again more on Monday, but this uh, is a great resource. Yes. Two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, uh, is J a Bessel's function? In no, the, it's not uh, yeah, that's what the cosine. Yeah, yeah, no. and and uh, you know, it could be in the in the real fly. It could have components like that, but it's probably more of, of like a von Mises function. In other words, a kind of a narrowed cosine. It should be. A, it's a little narrower than a cosine, so it's probably a von Mises function. And uh, what are uh, the dynamics of theta i? Yeah. Uh, so, so um, th theta i is purely a label here. Okay, it has no dynamics at all. The, let me go back. The dynamics is in these rates, which would be, you know, related to the calcium imaging. But the theta i is just a label. It just tells you where on the circle that particular neuron is located. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So. Here is the delta seven neuron. And the reason I just showed you, uh, I showed you this is because you can practically see the cosine with your eye here. The inputs to this neuron uh, are in this broadly uh, shaped thing. You should be able to see that this is within the protocerebral bridge. So within the region that I've circled, it gets input from these compass neurons. Um, and you can see the density really kind of looks like a cosine. And I'll show you that that's actually true uh, in a second. Um, so, so that's the cosine part. I mentioned that it's inhibitory and you can see the 180 degrees because the output of this is not right in the middle of the cosine the where it should be, but it's separated. And if you look at this separation, it's exactly 180 degrees. So. Um, so, so you can actually see, this is why I'm saying that the, the anatomy here is so powerful. You can practically see that this is a cosine shifted by 180 degrees just by looking at the picture. If you want more verification, you can go through all the EM and count the synapses between the, the delta seven. By the way, the delta seven is also a family of neurons. So, um, you know, here, you have cosines of, of lots of different angular distances. So if I showed you another delta seven, it would look like this only shifted over. So its cosine might be here or more over here or more over here. Its output will be shifted to different parts. So there's a family of them representing this cosine function. Um, and um, if, you, if you look and plot out the effective connections from EPG to delta seven, delta seven back to EPG, and you plot them, in fact, you get a cosine. So this is looking at the counts of synapses 
that effectively connect one EPG, that's the compass neuron, to it to to another, um, and you know with remarkable accuracy, you get a cosine shape. This will come up again on Monday. This this connection really really is a cosine. There may be others that are a little narrower than a cosine, uh, but but this delta seven one is is there, and it, it's really there to be a cosine. It's very important that this is a cosine shape. So evolution has realized that the cosine is a special function and, and you'll see this coming back. So, so this is how the, the cosine can be made. Okay, so let's go on to moving the bump. So, so far, you know, we have a kind of a boring model. It just builds a bump and lets it sit there doing nothing. So what about moving the bump? So in the, in the classic literature on bumps, it was well known that the best way to move a bump is to in introduce into this connectivity. So again, just to remind you, this is the connectivity from neuron J to neuron I. Uh, the first term, you know, is a is a kind of a typical Mexican, what people call Mexican hat shape that retains the bump. The best way to get the bump to move is to add a little thing that's like a sign because you know that's going to be asymmetric, um, anti-symmetric actually. It's going to be excitation on one side inhibition on the other side. And, and as a result, the, the bump's going to run away. Um, and so let me just show you that. Here's a model that where the bump is just built on a line so that the angle's going from zero to 360. This wasn't really, I, I built this not particularly for the fly thing. Um, and what you'll see is initially when I start this movie, hopefully I have started it, um, that the bump won't do anything. But now I turned on the sign term. And you can see the sign term just causes the bump to move and the bump will move forever here uh, until the video stops um, because of the introduction of that sign term. Okay, well now one way to introduce a sign is just to introduce a cosine term that's shifted. Because of course, if you use the angle uh, addition formulation for cosines, a cosine that's shifted involves a sign. So in fact, this is the way that the fly introduces a sign. It introduces a shifted cosine, actually. So let me show you how this works. Um, so, so we're talking about these terms in the model now. The coefficients here are, are reflect um, the input to the left and the right bridge from proprioception and motor signals. So basically, you can see, uh, just as promised, instead of a, a zero centered cosine, we have cosine shifted by 45 degrees plus and minus here on the left and on the right. Um, that introduces this sign term that gets the thing moving. Um, and these, these coefficients, the strength of these connections are governed by whether the fly is turning or not. So if the fly is not turning, L and R will match, and these two terms will cancel each other. But if the fly turns to the left, then this term gets big and this term starts dominating. The fly turns to the right, this term gets big and this term starts dominating. Um, and that causes a, a motion back and forth. So I a think, question. Yeah. Uh, is angle theta a function of time? No, no, I, I clearly didn't get this across. Angle theta is a label. It's just a label attached to each neuron. I goes from about one to 50 here. I is the, is the label on the neurons and theta is just where it lives in the structure. So it is not a function of time. It's, it's R that's a function of time. That's the activity of the cell. So um, yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't make this, this clear. So these are just labels on the cells but what I'm plotting in my movies is R, okay? I, I did kind of jump over that, I apologize. Please let me know if that's not clear because that, that's important. So the, the dynamic variable here is R, not theta. Okay, so these terms are made very much like what I just showed you. I showed you delta seven producing a, an effective EPG to EPG coupling um, with, uh, through, through itself. These are, are neurons called PEN1s, P-E-N1s. Um, and the trick with them, so here is a, is a different de de depiction of the EPG. So these are the compass neurons. And again, this would be, let's say, compass neuron number 20. 
So I would be 20 for this neuron. And the theta refers to this angle, the fact that it lives here, or if you want, along this structure that it lives here. So, um, you know, if you, if you call the top of the thing zero, the, this, this theta would be very close to zero. Okay, so those are the EPGs, and there's a correspondence between the angle here and the angle here. So they, they you know, project to, to corresponding stars. But if you look at these PEN2s, they're shifted by 45 degrees. That's the pi over four here. And you can see that, again, right in the anatomy. So if you go to this compartment, what's happening is the bump is made here. The signal's transferred here. It's transferred over to the PEN, but then it's projected back and it, it misses its target. Instead of going to the center one, it flips over by one of these uh, segments and they're each 45 degrees. So this is 45, 90, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's exactly how this term comes in and why this term is not just maintaining the bump, but turning the bump. And you can actually see quite easily how this works. So if the fly um, makes a turn, what happens is, uh, and let's say it makes a turn to the left, the, this, this PEN1 on this side gets activated. That activates some excitation on, on the right side here, and that drags the bump one step further around. And then the fly keeps turning, the next guy gets activated. And so it's like a dog chasing its tail. Every time the bump moves, it activates a new PEN1, but that PEN1 is always 45 degrees ahead. And so the dog chases its tail until the fly stops turning and it comes back to equilibrium. The same thing would happen for a turn in the other direction. Um, so let me just show you that working. So again, and there's a, a question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good. I don't fully understand. Could you emphasize again the RJ dependence on the right side of the dr by dt equation? Yeah. So the terms that I'm talking about are this these coefficients l and r, and I haven't in the model given you where they come from. So, and, and they would be driven by other neurons. That's not part of the model. But the idea is when the animal makes a left turn, L gets big. And when the model, uh, when the animal makes a right turn, R gets big. So that's what I'm referring to. So that means these two terms that initially might be zero or they might be in balance, suddenly this term becomes very strong and that derives the bump in one direction or this other term becomes strong. So the, the activity, the activation of the left and the right bridge I'm talking about is reflected in these parameters, L and R. Okay, does that, does that answer? Uh, thanks for asking that because I, I didn't really make that clear. Okay, so, so again, in, in, in this side, the L got big because a neural signal went into this side of the bridge and it started this process of, of the dog chasing its tail. In this case, the fly turned to the right, the right bridge got activated. That means that R parameter got big. And now you set off this chain reaction of, 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 the, of the bump chasing itself until the fly stops turning and then the L and R become equal and everything settles down. There's another question. Yeah. Uh, why, is, uh, why the angle drift is 45 degrees and not any other value. Does this value yeah. hold any special significance to the fly? In what I'm talking about now, no, it doesn't really matter. Um, where did I do the picture? It's just convenient, I think, for the anatomy because it bumps over to the next compartment, right? These compartments are 45. So just anatomically, this would have worked totally fine if it only went, you know, 20 degrees or 30 degrees. So I just think anatomically, it was easier to target the next compartment than to try to split the difference. But in, in what I'm saying now, it did not have to be 45 degrees. When it comes to Monday, we'll see a 45 degree shift that really did have to be 45 degrees. Or for example, the 180 that I showed you really had to be 180 because it had to give you a minus sign. So, uh, but, but you're correct in this case, the 45 did not have to be 45. 
good point. Okay, so here's this model running. So initially what will happen is you just have a bump, but if you watch the top right, that's, you notice that suddenly got wider. That, that was uh, the, R, the R parameter being increased, and now the L parameter just got increased. And when that happens, you, you, you upset the balance in this model, and it drives the bump. Uh, let me just show it to you again, one way or the other. So here is the right turn signal coming in now, off it goes. And now you'll see, if you watch the left, at, there it goes, the left signal came in. So again, <clears throat> those signals are just put by hand into this model. There's no proprioceptive motor system in this thing, but that's the idea that in the fly, those are carried by signals. Okay, so uh, good. I think we're doing good on time. Um, so I just wanted to show you a work um, that was done by Sung Soo Kim in this collaboration with the, with the Jaya Raman lab, where he actually made this system. So, so far I've talked about this system work with a, with a very obvious landmark. So we're going back to the visual case now, by the way. Uh, for, for a while I was showing you this, this self-generated motion signal, but this is now we're going back to vision um, and and just wondered, you know, it had always been tested with bars that were very obvious landmarks. What if you just take a picture? This is a picture of the Genelia landscape um, and you you re reduce its resolution to the rather pathetic resolution of the fly, which is what you're seeing in the middle. And you put that on the screen around the fly um, and you move it, you know, you move it in closed in closed uh, loop. Does it work? Um, and in fact, it does. So the bump will align to it and then the bump will move around to it. And here's an example of that. So the red line is some point in this picture that in fact, the fly tends to be, be using as a landmark. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's this tree or something like that. Um, and then the blue shows the, the brightness of the bump and then this is just the, the um, regions of that ellipsoid body have just been you know, laid flat. So this is zero degrees to 360 degrees, you know, just plotted on a linear plot. Um, and so you can see actually, yeah, you see it here. It's not quite um, 180 because there's a piece of the screen that, that doesn't uh, close up. But basically you can think of this as zero to 360 or minus 180 to 180. Those There's a the... question. Mm -hmm. does, does the bump smoothly transition between segments or jump discreetly? What would the resolution of the system be? Yeah, great question. You do not notice a jump. I think there are probably all sorts of mechanisms designed to smooth this out that are not in the model that I showed. Um, you um, In the model, you don't see... Um, a jump because the model has been smoothed out. I suspect that's true in the in the natural thing. And and uh, Anne Hermanstadt has a paper coming out on various mechanisms that could do that. Um, then you know I'm not going to tell you about those because we don't know what they are. But uh, despite the fact that it looks like it's been built discreetly, this system seems pretty smooth and pretty accurate. We really again don't know the accuracy, but it's clearly better than one wedge, which is 45 degrees. It's so you can think of it as a continuous uh, system, but that's an excellent question. And I think more research will have to be done to really figure out how with only about 50 neurons here, this is able to interpolate so well between this discrete structure. Another question. Okay. Yeah. Is the job of the Delta seven neuron to distinguish between the motion in the direction from the fly's body orientation? Yeah, its its purpose is really only to support the bump. So it really only contributes to that first term I was talking about. And other neurons are responsible for this, you know, moving the bump term that I just discussed and for what I'm about to discuss, which is carrying the visual input in. So I think you can think of that delta seven as really a coupler of, of the neurons to themselves. But on Monday, it's also used as a coupler of the compass signal to other, other neurons. But it's not part of this moving of the bump system. Okay. Okay, I'll just show you another. Here's another scene at Genelia. Um, and I just wanted to show you this because um, 
it's not necessarily true that the you know whatever you, wherever you think for example maybe the tree was the origin of this red line um, that's tracking the image as it moves around the fly it isn't necessarily true that you know whatever whatever you think is the landmark is what the bump aligns to there can be an offset like this but as you notice they're they're moving very much in parallel so this is what i said at the beginning of my talk it isn't necessarily that the bump aims straight towards a landmark, but rather that it is fixed in the world and, and rotates um, when the fly rotates. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about this term. So this is the term by which visual imagery drives the, drives the bump. <clears throat> and um, you can see in the model, it's just a symmetry breaking term. So this, this term here, again, theta is this angle around the ring. Because it's a, a function of the difference, it's completely symmetric all the way around the ring. That's why um, the bump, if, if you forget about that purple term for a second, the bump can form anywhere in the ring with equal, uh, equal structure. So that's because this, is, this part of the, of the model is rotationally invariant around the ring. But now you can see the presence of a visual object, that's what V stands for, at a particular angle breaks that symmetry. And of course, that's exactly what we want. When there's an object out there, you don't want the um, bump to be anywhere it wants to be. You want it to be aligned to that object or you know, aligned uh, with, a, with a fixed offset, but locked to that object. That, this term does that, and it represents the visual inputs um, to, to this system that I'll talk about for the rest of the time <clears throat> I'm talking about, because obviously they're important. Um, there's what, they're really what ties the fly into its external world. Okay, so here's a model with such a term in it. That term um, is, uh, it, it corresponds to an object like a sun, which is given by the red dot. Let me run this. Um, what you can see is, the bump forms and then now if we move the red dot the bump is locked linked to it so now this is this cosine of v minus theta term um, uh, driving pushing the bump around and and um, you know locking it now here we're looking at the the this system as if we were inside the fly's brain so what it looks like it looks like the sun is moving and the bump is moving with the sun what really would be happening is the fly is turning, that red star would be in a fixed location and the bump would be tracking it fixed to the external world. But we, this is as if we were inside the fly's brain looking at the system. And of course, in that case, it looks like the world is turning around the fly. <clears throat> okay. So there are a whole bunch of neurons that carry the visual signal into this donut. Remember, this is the ellipsoid body, the donut, where the, the compass is um, made, uh, signal the bump is made. Uh, and it, these neurons that I'm showing here in purple are some of the neurons that carry visual signals in there and are gonna be generating this term that breaks the symmetry and causes the bump to track a particular uh, the environment in a particular way with a particular orientation. The, the neurons I'll talk about at first, um, these are their receptive fields. So um, in an earlier paper, Selig and Jairaman measured the, the, the fields of what are these are called ring neurons. You're gonna see in a second why they're called ring neurons. And they look like pretty typical visual neurons. In other words, there's a region of the visual world that activates them so that you're just seeing that if there's a light uh, in, in, within this region of the visual world, it will activate this particular cell, but over here it won't activate it. So very typical receptive field that we know from many visual neurons. Um, but a funny thing happens as that neuron, as that information get carried into the compass system. So there's gonna be others on the other side, you know, there, there are lots of these neurons. Um, but when you look at them, um, if I take away uh, the EPG signal here, obviously you can see why they're called ring neurons. Their synapses form a complete 360 ring around the donut. 
And that seems like a completely weird thing to do. In other words, this, um, this neuron here um, responds at a particular angle, let's say, to light at a particular angle when the bar goes through, let's say, you know, 30 degrees. And yet when it carries it into the compass, it smears it around the full 360 degrees. It's as if it, it threw out um, the, the topology, the topography, uh, and it, it's almost as if it threw out that information because this signal from a, a region of the, of the sky is going equally, it looks like equally around the whole ring and it doesn't look like you've broken the symmetry, right? If, 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 you, if you evenly distribute that information around the circle, now the bump's gonna be able to go wherever it wants. And so that gave uh, us, let me see if I have the references and also uh, a group in, in Rachel Wilson's lab, the idea that these synapses, which are connecting these visual ring neurons to the compass neurons have got to be plastic. In other words, there's gotta be a way in which this symmetry gets broken and causes uh, a preference of the bump to one location corresponding to wherever you know, that visual image happens to be. And so um, it makes sense that this might be a plastic system because if you think about you know, when you walk in a room, when I walked into my office this morning, um, I didn't think about it, of course, but I, I think probably first thing I did was orient myself. I know the windows over there. I know the doors over there. I know my desk is in front of me. I know the computers in front of me. And so every time we move around, we, we, we orient ourselves to the world. I'll talk about that again a little at the end. And the fly should be able to do this too. So if it moves to a different environment with different landscape and different uh, landmarks, it has to be able to reconfigure its map of the world onto the compass using those particular landmarks. It can't, you know, have one map for life because, you know, sometimes the, the, the sun goes behind the clouds and you have to use another landmark. Uh, it has to be flexible. And I'm going to show you how flexible, in fact, it is. So, so I'm going to start with a model, a very simple model, but it's a good model to how, how we thought about this system. And, you know, although it's, it's an idealization, it's kind of how the system works. So what I've tried to depict here, um, in here are supposed to be these compass neurons. So they live in these wedges um, and, the, and they're parameterized. Now I'm going to parameter again, like before, by an index I. Um, and remember, they have an angle associated with them, which is, is part of their label. And I'm going to label the ring neurons. So all of these blue guys are ring neurons that their receptive fields aim out in different directions. Um, and then this crazy histogram is supposed to represent a light pattern in the, in, the, in the world around. So those are the patterns of light and dark that the fly is going to use to establish a map um, to the external world. That's the idea here. Um, and I'm going to just make up what I think the synapses have to be. So as you saw, anatomically, those synapses look like they're all the same strength. But I want to imagine that a synapse that goes from, oh, first of all, I, I should mention one more thing. I, I'm associating with each ring neuron another angle, and that's the angle of its receptive field. So this neuron might see 30 degrees to the right. Another one might be 45 degrees to the left. And you know, they have their receptive fields around the circle. So this theta A refers to the receptive field angle of that neuron. And this theta I is where uh, this particular um, ring neuron, uh, not ring neuron, but compass neuron lives. For example, this one here might live at zero. And I'm gonna imagine that the synapse from this guy to this guy is proportional to a cosine. You'll see why, if you want, it's just a guess for now. Um, and we'll come back to where that comes from, but let's it just be a guess. And just to make life simple, I'm gonna assume that this particular uh, ring neuron likes visual objects at its preferred angle. So that, that's what I was saying. If this one is 30 degrees right, then it responds very strongly. If that, if the, let's say the bar that the fly is tracking is 30 degrees to the right. And moving away from that, I, again, I'm giving it a cosine tuning curve. 
So it falls off, it actually gets inhibited if, the, if it's on the other side. Again, th this is made up, but we know the tuning curves are something like this, and you'll see it, it, it's advantageous to use cosines because you can calculate things. So does there, is there any questions about that? Because I, I, I have not done a great job of my notation. So, so again, this, this has a preferred visual angle of theta A, it responds to the visual object located at angle V as a cosine, and then it carries its signal into the compass through the, a coupling strength that depends on its identity and the identity of the, of, the, of the compass neuron. And that strength is proportional to the difference in these angle labels. Again, these are just labels for the cells. Okay, so why did I do this? Oh, one more thing. The input from the ring neurons uh, to the compass neurons are going to be the synaptic strengths multiplied by their activity and then just summed around all the different ring neurons. So we're going to do that calculation now. And the point is that if, if this works, if this model is self-consistent, I should get what I assumed at the beginning was that the, the compass neurons were being driven um, by uh, uh, a strength that corresponds to the difference between their angle and the visual object. So you can see what's being happening here is the receptive field angle of the visual ring neurons is being transferred into a preferred bump angle of the, of the, of the compass neurons. And to see how this works, you just have to do some tri simple trigonometry. So I, I just put in a constant here to make things come out nice. But the input to compass neuron I is just the synaptic strength, that's this, times the activity of the ring neuron added up over all the different ring neurons. That's an easy calculation to do due to um, a trigonometric identity, it allows you to write the cosine of, of a product like this as, as a cosine of the difference and a cosine of the sum. Now, if you add the second term around the circle, because it's evenly, ex, ex, uh, um, evenly distributed around the circle, you get zero. And so this is the reason I chose the synapses the way they are. It gives you exactly the, the, the answer you want. So the visual selectivity of the ring neuron has been transferred to these sign, to, through these synapses into a bump selectivity of the compass neurons, and now the compass neurons are going to track the visual object. All right, so that's that's you know nice simple math. But where do these synapses come from? I mentioned that they had to be plus plastic, and here's the idea here. So we have to explain that when the the um, ring neurons have this cosine visually tuned activity, and the the ring neurons have a bump of activity, and I'm going to assume that bump is also a cosine, um, that I want to argue that these synapses will automatically occur due to Hebbian plasticity. So the idea is you have a cosine shape. I, I've drawn it as a red dot, but really think of it as a cosine shaped activity pattern around this circle on one side of the synapse and a cosine shaped activity pattern around the blue circle due to the visual object. And now I want Hebbian plasticity on the connections between those two um, during the following process. So what you imagine is a fly comes into a new area, looks around, sees the visual image that I've tried to depict through these bars, and, um, and then does a turn. So it turns in the world and the visual world turns around it. But at the same time, the bump moves. The bump moves, let's say, Due to these proprioceptive signals that I that I that I covered in the in the other part of my talk, and the, then the animal keeps turning, the fly keeps turning, and let's say, for example, turns in a full circle while heavy and plasticity is going on. So what's going to happen? So in in heavy and plasticity, the idea is that the change in the synapse is proportional to the product of the activity on the two sides of the synapse. So this is the activity of the ring neurons, um, and this is the activity of the bump in the, in the, um, in the, in the compass neurons. So all I've done is, is just taken a product of those two, 
And now what I have to do is say, well, if the fly is moving in the world, then the visual object and the bump are linked, um, not because of these synapses yet, but just because of the physical fact that if the fly turns and the bump turns by proprioception, inevitably the visual world turns too. So when that happens, you're gonna end up, and let's say the fly turns around a full circle, the synapses that are gonna result from that experience are just gonna be the product of the bump now moving with the visual world and the, the, the ring neurons. And it's the same calculation as before. You do a little trigonometric identity, one of the terms vanishes and you get exactly the right answer. So the, the upshot here is that if the fly has no visual map, but it can move its bump due to its own body, then all it has to do is let's say turn a circle in the world um, and move its bump according to its own knowledge that it's turning around and watch the visual world turn with it. And this mechanism will align that visual world onto the bump so that now the system can work by vision, it doesn't have to rely on proprioception anymore. Um, this is obviously an idealization um, and I'll, I'll say, you know, but, but I'm going to show you that it, the system basically works like this. Um, the, the, the cheat here is that these, um, one cheat at least, is that these synapses are actually inhibitory and the plasticity is actually anti-inhibitory, anti so there, again, there's, there's two minus signs here that I have not shown you in this calculation, but there are two of them, so they, they cancel. All right, so if this is really true, um, that there's plasticity in this system and that it's formed by a Hebbian-like process, a correlational process, then Sung Su said, well, we ought to be able to manipulate that process optogenetically and build whatever map we want. So, the key, remember, in order to build this map is you have to move the bump around the, the circle at the same time that you move the visual world around. Now, in, in, in the natural system, that would be done by the fly's internal circuitry, but we can use a laser uh, to optogenetically move the bump any way we want. And so that's exactly what Sung Su does. He optogenetically stimulates moves the bump around the circle while moving the visual image. And, and now he can build whatever map he wants. And so let me show you uh, that, that happening. So he just continues around the circle and then looks at the resulting map that if this, if this is at all true, should have been formed by heavy and plasticity. So here's a natural map that the fly just made itself. Again, you're seeing uh, the, the location of, of the visual object in red here. And here in blue, it's right on the, the edge of this 360 uh, fold out picture um, is the bump. And, and in, in this case, you can see the, the, the fly is not moving a whole lot, but you can see the relationship between the, the, the center of the visual image and the bump, which is, you know, it's a little below it in this plot. Then what Sung Su, Sung Su did was uh, to um, enforce a, a, the location of the bump, that's what you're seeing here with the optogenetics, while dragging the image around the fly. But he did it purposely in the opposite orientation from the existing map. So he did it flipped, and you'll see the answer here. And when he did that, he flipped the map. So whereas the initial map had the bump above the, the the object here. Now the bump is below the object. Whoops. So, so he could remap the system. Again, naturally, we would think of this happening if the fly had gone into a new environment and remapped. And by the way, the flies will sp spontaneously remap their compass sometimes in the lab, even though they're not really being moved around. Um, but you know, in this case, it could be done artificially uh, so we could see the process happen. How long right, does now, this process take? How long does it take? Yeah, it takes a, a few minutes. It takes, a, a, you know, generally it's a, it's a few like here, one, two, three, four, five laps around, you know, so he went around the circle five times or so. It takes a few times around the circle 
And are those uh, time scales consistent with uh, what we know about Hebbian plasticity time scales? Yeah, we don't. We really have no idea how fast this occur could occur in the fly. My guess is that when the fly wants to remap, it it actually puts a modulator on the system that speeds up the plasticity. So my guess is this is artificially slow because what we're doing is forcing the system to remap probably when the fly doesn't really intend to have that happen. So we're kind of overwhelming the system with a very strong bump and, and a long exposure and allowing plasticity to occur, perhaps even when the modulatory environment doesn't favor it. So my so, guess is that in nature, the fly could do this quicker. Yeah, so you know, there's, there's old experiments going back where what they did was the, the equivalent of a, of a a prism, uh, you know, where you invert the mm -hmm. uh, uh, its visual field, and mm -hmm. so now if if the fly takes a action in the certain direction, the visual field moves in the direction opposite to yep. where it would have moved. And we know that flies will adjust to this. Uh, okay, great. And I, I wonder if this. So you have set me up beautifully. Two, <laughs> two or three more slides. Okay, okay? Right. I'll show you exactly what you said. That was great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So there's a couple of things you can notice about the mathematics here. The, it was critical that this second term, this term be zero. And the reason it was zero is because you're, you're adding, a, a, you're summing up a cosine around a circle and, and, you know, the, 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 the sum around a circle is zero. The, the area under a cosine is zero, but you might notice that the thing that appears here is not the visual angle, but twice the visual angle. And that means that actually you only have to go halfway around the circle to get this to work. So a prediction from the model is this, that this should work even if you only go halfway around the circle. So here's an example um, of, uh, of that, sorry. The map again has been flipped. In this case, it was originally above the bump and now it's below the bump. And it was done by Sung Su only using half the circle. And then here's the example that, that was just brought up. So um, we've been looking at cases where the bump and the visual world move in concert, move the right way, uh, like they would in a normal natural situation. And I argued that that would make this cosine connection and that that would make the, this cosine tuned visual input and it would align the bump. Now, again, what you can notice in the mathematics is if you happen to couple them backwards, like you would with a prism or things like that, we did it a different way, um, you know, go through the math, what you find is you get a different uh, synaptic map and you get a backwards map. And so that's exactly what we did. So in this case, you can see there's a natural map. And now um, Sung Su did now optogenetically, not with a prism, he moved the visual world one way and moved the bump backwards. And sure enough, you get a backwards map when that happens. So here you see the bump is moving down here when the visual world is up, you can see that it's reversed. So the, the answer to, to your thing is indeed, um, the, this system can learn a backwards map. Uh, here, you know, in a kind of an artificial way, but I guess in the, in the example you were describing, in a natural way, it learned a backwards map. So, um, and, and you know, I, I think of this as an example of, um, once you have a learning sy system, it's often even more general than it might have to be, give, pr given that, that flies don't run into prisms that often and, and don't hopefully run into optogenetics that often. Um, this system is just, built to be a very general purpose learning system and it can kind of learn any map you want. My guess is that the map could even be kind of disjoint. There's a, a paper just for reference. Uh, there's an old yeah, paper I would, it, uh, called Can a Fly Ride a Bicycle? Um, this this was, you know, I think it's it would fit right in here. Uh, good, I'll I'm look it up. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great, great. Thank you for that reference. I didn't know it had been done. Uh, in, in thing, can a fly ride a bicycle? I ought to be able to remember that. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, where am I? All right, so yeah, I promised to talk about different signals. Um, so um, 
there are multiple um, signals that come in and drive the compass. Basically, the compass is very important to the fly. I, I've, all, I've mentioned that there are body signals, the, 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 the leg motion, the feeling of turning, so proprioceptive motor signals. I've talked about visual signals associated with particular objects. I'm about to talk about another kind of visual signal. There's also wind signals, more along the line of what Kathy uh, Nagel talked to you about. And basically anything that can help the fly orient is going to come into this system. So what about conflicts? This came up. This is a great question, and it's a great problem that this system might be able to answer. I'll give you two little bits of information. One is just an anecdotal piece of information from um, Vivex Lab. And that is that they can change the gain of the visual world. So in other words, when the fly turns, they can turn the world faster and slower than it would really turn in reality. And if they increase the speed beyond about a factor of two, the fly will no longer use the visual world uh, to, to, to drive the, the, the compass. In other words, the fly senses something's gone wrong here. That's not a reliable signal. And, um, as, you know, somehow shuts it down. Uh, the perhaps maybe by not activating the plasticity that I've been telling you about, so that you just say, you know, the, the world's gone crazy. I'm not going to pay attention. Maybe, maybe the fly is nauseated, but whatever. It definitely doesn't like the visual world that's careening around it in unpredictable ways. In the in the um, EM in the connectome, you see a hierarchy of signals where some come in with more strength, some come in more proximally on the, on the EPG neurons. And so it looks like there's sort of a hierarchy of more trustworthy signals and less trustworthy signals. But I think in the future, this could become a wonderful system for sort of decision-making um, and inference of reliability of, of, of evidence um, this system has to be doing that, and, and it's probably doing it in pretty cool ways. We don't know anything about that yet, but, um, but that's there. There's okay. a question. Yeah. Can the rest of the brain that reads out the bump for the purpose of generating behavior adapt to the reversal of the bump? Yeah. So unfortunately, well, I guess, you know, we would have to ask about the fly, whether the fly did succeed in riding the bicycle or not. But in these experiments, um, the, the, the reversal lasted, of course, the laser was turned off. The reversal lasted for minutes, um, but, it, it, but eventually the fly righted itself, presumably using normal vision and, and, and its own system. And during that time, we didn't do any kind of behavioral experiments. It would be totally cool to flip the bump and, and do them. I think you'll see that on my, on my talk on Monday, uh, there'll be all sorts of predictions. I mean, I would definitely predict that all sorts of navigation things would go backwards um, if, if you did that. And, and that the fly, um, in, unless it readapted the way that way we were just talking about with this paper, um, if, if while it was backwards, it would, it would have its problems. <clears throat> okay, so I mentioned that there's a sort of a hierarchy of signals coming into this system. And so I just wanted to end with a, just a little bit about which signals at the top of the hierarchy. The way you can, you can sort of tell that is by how many synapses it has, you know, where those synapses come in. It's a guess, but anatomically, the, the winner of the hierarchy are these neurons, um, and they carry a polarized light signal into the fly. So it, it's, it's many people's belief that the, the main source of orientation for the fly is actually polarized light. And I thought I'd just end by talking a little bit about that. Um, so in, when you're out in the sky, the sky looks blue to you. It looks blue to you because light from the sun scatters off the, off the sky and you're seeing light that didn't take a direct path from the sun into your eye, but took a path like what I'm showing here where there's a, a, a vector that carried the light from the sun to the atmosphere um, and then a, a different vector that took it from wherever it happened to scatter in the atmosphere and into, in this case, into the fly's eye. Now, this process results in the blue color of the sky. 
because it happens more at uh, shorter wavelengths, um, but it also uh, causes the light in the sky to be polarized. Um, we do not sense that polarization, but it's why uh, some sunglasses are polarized because this happens not only from the sky, but it also happens from surfaces. So if you, you, you often get polarized um, reflections from surfaces that you wanna cut out with, with your sunglasses. Anyway, it's very simple how this happens. We can think of the light coming from the sun as being broken up into two orientations of electric field. One where the electric field is oscillating in and out of the, the plane of my slide of this, of this figure. So that's what that bullseye is supposed to mean. And another one, uh, that's orthogonal to that. Sorry, I didn't draw the orthogonal. Uh, you'll see it in a second. The one that's going to be in the upright direction on this plot. Now, what happens when this E field comes into the to the to the, to the scattering point? It shakes the molecules. Um, they re-radiate that energy, and they re-radiate it, uh, you know, unaltered. So they 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 vibrate in and out of the board. Um, and you know, maybe, and and they they re radiated, and that's the, the source of scattered light. <clears throat> but what happens with the with the orthogonal orientation that I've, I've drawn here up into the right um, is that it shakes the the uh, molecules along its its direction, and we are not sensitive. The, the, there's no emission of light along the line of sight. So shaking the molecules in that direction generates a field but shaking them in this direction doesn't. And so we lose part of the field. Um, in it, what happens is there's a projection of the strength of that E vector onto uh, a direction orthogonal to the line of sight of the fly here. It's it, by the, the gamma here is the scattering angle. And, and that causes um, the light to be polarized because whereas the, the bullseye light, the light perpendicular to the, to the plane um, gets 100% transmitted, this one gets reduced. And it causes a polarization in the sky that's, that's parallel to the cross product. It's, it's in and out of the, of the plane here. And so I should wind up. Um, and so that causes a polarization pattern of the sky that looks like this. It's along these, these uh, long latitude lines. And, and there are, are photoreceptors in the fly's eye at the top of its, of its eye, looking at the sky, these R7 and R8 that have orthogonal polarization patterns in them, sensitivities, they rotate as you go along the, the dorsal rim of the fly. And there's a pathway to carry this polarization signal in that has been studied in a very nice paper by Hardcastle. And um, Sharon Sue and, and Rudy Bainey and I are also studying the effect of this on the compass. All right, I, I, I wanna just then end by, by one more little comment and, and then take questions. Sorry, I probably left, should have left more time. The, 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 the compass signal in the fly is really crucial, as I said, to the fly's orientation to the world. Um, if, you, if you shut down the compass, there's, it isn't just that the fly can't navigate. It really cannot, just cannot figure out its orientation relative to the world around us itself. And there's a very similar kind of thing that happens, unfortunately, to some people who have a stroke on one side of the brain. This only happens halfway in humans. It's called hemineglect. And it, 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 it's, it's, it's in the um, uh, parietal cortex. And people essentially lose their coordinate system for the external world on one side of their body. So for example, if a person with the condition is asked to draw a clock, they will draw something like this, where the, they know the clock has the full you know, set of numbers, but they just cannot conceive of the, of the left half of the clock. And this is a beautiful experiment in which patients with this problem were asked to, to imagine that they were standing in the, in the cathedral square in Milan and imagine what they, this was all in their minds, imagine sites that they could see. And they were all from Milan. So they named a bunch of things, these red dots. Uh, they notice they're all on one side. And then they were asked to say, turn around and imagine you're standing here. And then they, they mentioned all these white circles. So, so they can't even you know, imagine the space on the other side. And, and I believe that flies without a compass 
really have a very similar thing. They cannot relate to the world around them. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, next time, but I'm happy to, I, I'm kind of out of time, but I'm happy to take any other questions you might have um, if, if we're not in a rush to end. Otherwise I'm finished. Um, there's a question uh, that was posted just a little while ago, but I waited until you finished. How do these inferences from the plasticity that the flies exhibit correspond to the advantages that they behaviorally possess? Yeah, so I would say, you know, what, what the fly wants to do when it forms this thing is to choose a reliable landmark. So, so in, in this case, this system, you, you know, the, I'd be able to better, better uh, explain this on Monday. This system is just the start. This is just orienting the fly to the world around it. Now, let, how about doing something? That, that involves other neurons that receive this signal and then do computations, like which way should I go? What should I do? Um, and so the only thing this system has to do is to latch on, I would say, to a good landmark. Um, and as if it applies a good uh, signal, just like I know, you know, the door's over here. So when I'm done with you guys, I'll turn that way and, and go out of my office. Um, it, 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 all I need is to have a good orientation of the world. So that's that's all this system is trying to do. Okay. Uh, I think there are no more questions. I think we had plenty of questions along the way. And that was yeah, good. Thank point. you for asking those. That's really helpful to me to know how I'm doing and, and what you're interested in. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everybody. I'll see you on Monday.